We have 10 days until Super Bowl 55. We welcome you to NFL Total Access. Hello, everybody. I am Red Lewis. And as we get set for Brady versus Mahomes, it's another top flight quarterback dominating the headlines. Deshaun Watson making his move and requesting a trade from the Houston Texans ahead. Why it went wrong in Houston, who's in the market for Watson, what it will take to get him, and how the Texans regroup. So let's get right to it here. The why has become clear. Frustration with ownership and management in Houston over some personnel moves on being shut out of the conversation about a new GM and head coach. And now an official trade request has been made. A transaction that could fetch the biggest compensation package that we've ever seen as quarterbacks of this caliber and this age just don't become available. And we've got it covered from every angle. We're going to get the details from our NFL Network insider Ian Rappaport, the front office perspective from our former GM Scott Pioli, and the player perspective from Andrew Hawkins and the Hall of Famer Terrell Davis. Ian Rappaport, let's start with you here. Now that the request has been made, as you've been reporting, what's next for Deshaun Watson? I feel like it might be easier to identify the teams that won't be interested, but who will be the serious players for Watson Services? And no doubt about it, this kind of thing never happens in the NFL. A quarterback in his prime, potentially available for teams. And we've known there's been some discontent between Deshaun Watson and the Houston Texans. He has not been happy for some time, as we've been talking about for a couple of weeks. And while the Texans have not shopped him and have not been willing to consider trade requests, teams have been calling. Now that there is an official trade request publicly from Deshaun Watson, I would expect that to increase dramatically. From what I understand, more than half the teams have called the Texans on Deshaun Watson. If you're wondering who could be interested, I would say almost everyone, but a couple <laughs> key ones to keep an eye on. The New York Jets, of course, assuming uh, if they do end up moving on from Sam Darnold. The Carolina Panthers, who still need a quarterback in the future, I'm told they are expected to be aggressive. The Chicago Bears still have a quarterback issue. So do the Colts. Hard to imagine him going uh, in the division, though. But essentially, anyone who needs a quarterback is going to be calling. And Ian, with a, a trade as unprecedented as this one will be, what will the compensation look like? How high can you count? The Houston Texans, if they do decide to trade Deshaun Watson, are going to get a, a trade package that is going to be, as you mentioned, unprecedented. We've seen some big quarterback deals. Jay Cutler in 2009 went for two ones and a starter. It is expected to be more than that. This is probably going to rival some of the draft moves with multiple first rounders. You're talking maybe not two, maybe three first rounders and players. This is a generational quarterback who is also a great person and a great leader. If the Houston Texans decide to part ways with Deshaun Watson, it is going to be because they have no choice, because the package is that big, and because it is something they will use to rebuild the rest of their organization. Again, the Texans have not publicly made that decision. And Ian, I'm going to come back to you a little bit later in the show on another quarterback's future with Ben Roethlisberger in just a little bit. Let's stick right here, though, because this deal's not done yet, right? We're, it, it's speculation here at this point, but Scott Pioli, if you're Nick Casario, the new GM now in Houston, are you still trying to salvage this deal, or do you have to just move on at this point? No, absolutely, you try to salvage this deal. You're talking about a 25-year-old player who's one of the best players in the National Football League, certainly one of the best quarterbacks in the National Football League. So you want to spend time, if you're Nick Casario and David Culley, trying to recruit him back home. Because remember, they don't have to trade him. Right now, he signed a deal only in September for $160 million, four-year extension. Deshaun Watson made that choice consciously to sign that contract. The Houston Texans hold their rights, but you don't want to be, if you're the Texans, you also don't want to be a bully about it. So they need to try to find a way to bring this player back into the fold. And I think one of the other important things is that they have to understand that they have an obligation to their team to do what is best for the team and keeping Deshaun Watson is what is best for the Houston Texans and everyone involved. And how about this first month on the job for Nick Casario, as challenging as I can remember for a new general manager. All right, let's let's dig in here, Terrell Davis. With with all things considered, now what's been your reaction to how this has all unfolded with Deshaun Watson? I, I'm just curious. What Scott talks about keeping them there and trying to convince them to stay. How do you do that? I mean, they've had time to do that, and he's waited and he's watched. And we've seen this organization make decisions without him being involved. 
I, here's what I would say. If I'm a player and I'm watching this, the Houston Texans aren't a team that I'm willing to go to as a free agent. I mean, this as you watch the way they've handled when they got rid of D-Hop, who was uh, Deshaun's favorite you know, target, without him even knowing, he found out through a text message. And then you talk about some of the trust issues that he has with Cal McNair, the owner of the, the Houston Texans. It just seems like that starts from the top of that organization and it has a trickle down effect. And if when you have a quarterback like Deshaun Watson in his prime saying he does not want to be there, that is some deep rooted issues that players around the league are aware of. Absolutely. I mean, if you put yourself in Deshaun Watson's shoes and just look at the situation, he's looking around the league. He's seeing what's happening with Matt Stafford. He's seeing what's happening with Aaron Rodgers and, and some of these incredible quarterbacks who are losing some of the best years of their lives because the talent around them isn't where it needs to be. Now, multiply that times tens. That that is the Texans. And also, he's watching a Super Bowl where he's seeing Patrick Mahomes with weapons like Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill or Tom Brady with the, the, the plethora of options that he has. And he does not want to waste his best years with an organization that will not build around him, right? And, and beyond that, when you talk about the issues, TD, you're absolutely right. When someone shows you who you are, you believe them. He has not been treated, in his opinion, like a top quarterback, like one of the best quarterbacks in the league with the decisions that have been made from DeAndre Hopkins to the coaching process. So I think for him, he's like, yo, I'm going to cut it off here now. We're going to go our separate ways and, you know, build the rest of our career from there. Dramatic turn of events, considering this is a player that signed a $160 million contract extension less than five months ago, and now an official trade request. Guys, thanks very much. So Watson taken two spots after Patrick Mahomes uh, in the draft about four years ago, right? Uh, and now would love to take his next team, if that's the way it goes, to what Patrick Mahomes is doing right now, which is preparing for yet another Super Bowl. They have a really good defense in general. I mean, obviously the the front is, is special uh, at every single position, but the whole entire defense, uh, uh, they make a lot of plays. And so for us, um, you have to have trust in those guys up front. They work their tail off uh, just like everybody else. And so I felt like they've done a great job all year of going against a lot of good defensive fronts. And for me, I just got to get the ball out of my hand in, in whatever way possible um, and not let those guys kind of destroy the game. You want to make sure that you get the guy, get it to our playmakers in space and try to see if we can make some plays happen. Do you remember what age you were when you first became conscious of Tom Brady or what, what your first memories of him would have been, how far back that goes? It's probably September 17th, 1995 when I was born. He's been around for a while. <laughs> nice work, Patrick Mahomes. Tom Brady and the Bucks on the practice field today. And it was the normal Thursday session. Reporters at the open portion of practice noted wide receiver Antonio Brown and linebacker Levante David were missing along with safeties Jordan Whitehead and Antoine Winfield Jr. Head coach Bruce Arians saying it's too early to say who will play in the Super Bowl. Here's coach today talking about his quarterback. The question back then was if there was a quarterback that that was a free agent, who would you want? And uh, yeah, of course it was Tom Brady, but um, not thinking he'd become a free agent. But once he did, it was... Uh, it was it was a pursuit that we wanted to make and uh, knew he had some interest. So, but again, if that's how you live life, I don't you, you sit and live in a closet and try to be safe, or you go have some damn fun. He's just he's a great man. He's a great leader. He's a great person. He's you know a great friend. He's very loyal. Um, he's just got a great way about communicating effectively with everybody around here, and everybody has a great affection for him for. Um, the person he is, there's nobody that ever would say anything bad about BA. He's just a, he's just, he's so endearing to everybody. And I think everyone wants to win for him. Two time coach of the year, but just done an amazing job this year with the team and really adverse situations. Um, and just, you know, love playing for him. I think that's a sentiment uh, that is echoed by many that have played for Bruce Arians. As we say hello again to Hawk and TD. Let's dig into this matchup now, uh, 10 days from now. And, and Hawk, I feel like it's, it's the question we ask every week with the Chiefs. How do you slow down the offense, right? But more specifically, how can this Bucks secondary find success against this talented crew of pass catchers from Kansas City? First off, I hope everybody finds someone that talks about them the way that Tom Brady <laughs> talks about Bruce Arians. But that's beside the point. How do you stop these Chiefs wide receivers and this wide receiver core? The, to be honest, the, the, the answer is I don't think you can. 
right? But you have to be an orthodox. If I was going to give them um, any advice for the Bucks going into the Super Bowl, I would say be unorthodox. We seen the Bills go into that last game and they followed the Raiders playbook to a T. They got deep, they kept everything in front and what happened? They still couldn't stop him because all Patrick Mahomes did was get the ball out quicker. I think he threw 5.8 yards per throw, which was the, his lowest of the season and would have been this, the second lowest for any team throughout the season. How do you stop a team that can hit a home run, the long ball, and also hit a home run with an inside the park home run? With Tyreek Hill, you throw him a seven yard pass and he takes it 70 yards. That's tough, that's tough to stop. Like when I'm playing basketball, it is harder for me to score against a guy who is unorthodox and has no idea what he's doing than it is someone I can measure their moves. So when you're going against the Chiefs, you gotta be unorthodox. Sit them back sometimes, sometimes be aggressive because there is no one thing that works against this offense. Yeah, I, I would guess that the, the Bucks secondary is going to spend a lot of time in the ears of uh, Jason Pierre-Paul and of Shaq Barrett. Like, hey, let's get some pressure on this guy here this week. Huh? You're going to give us the best chance to succeed. Uh, Terrell Davis, uh, let's look at, the, at both offenses now. And, and obviously talking with Hawk about the Chiefs, I mean, both of these offenses are known for their proficiency in the pass game. But when you look at the run games, which team do you feel like will need to rely on their run game more to find the ultimate success on Sunday? Yeah, Red, I think both of these teams really need to run the football uh, to be effective. But I'm, I'm going with the Chiefs in this one uh, as needing to run the ball a little bit more. And the reason is when you look at their offensive line, they just lost uh, Fisher, uh, Eric Fisher, their, their Pro Bowl left tackle last week. And now they're going to move uh, Mike Rimmers, who is their backup right tackle, over to left tackle. And then Andrew Wiley is going to come in and play the right tackle spot. So, listen, when you go up against the Bucks, you have to be able to have a balanced attack. You can't ask that line with two backup left uh, backup tackles to go up against JPP, Shaq Barrett, and the pressure that the Bucks defense is going to put on you. So you've got to have a little bit more balance. Now, I know you have Patrick Mahomes, who is the eraser, and they don't really need to run the, run the football. But I think with them running the football, it's going to balance that offense out. It's going to allow them to have a little bit more um, you know, ways where they're not being uh, pressured a lot. Yeah, and the good news for the Bucks defense, they got five sacks of JPP and Shaq Barrett last week against Aaron Rodgers, and they boast the number one rushing defense all year long. Thanks, guys. Get ready for an off-season carnival ride because the NFL QB carousel is about to hit top speed. Who is on the move and who needs to make a move? From a breakout season in green and gold to right here on Total Access. Today's special guest is Packers tight end Robert Tunney. What's 85's take on how the year ended and what's he hearing about what's coming next? Plus, how do you go from good to great to GOAT? It's the truth about Tom, and it's still to come on NFL Total Access. Back here on NFL Total Access, where Ben Roethlisberger will meet with Steelers ownership and head coach Mike Tomlin about his contract the week after the Super Bowl. This comes as both sides have agreed that Ben wants to come back and that the team can't afford him on his current deal with the way it is structured. And as promised, let's welcome back NFL Network insider Ian Rappaport. Uh, Ian, what's next here for the Steelers and for Roethlisberger? Well, the most important thing, Red, is that both sides decide have decided they want each other. Of all the things, the fact that Ben wants to be back, and he does, and the fact that the Steelers, as our Rooney told local reporters today, want him back as well at 39 years old, that's the biggest piece of this. How to make it work money-wise is a somewhat smaller issue because both sides do believe, as they've said very publicly today, that it is going to work. And the fact that Ben Roethlisberger told Ed Bouchette of The Athletic today that he doesn't really care about his salary, his agents probably will, but Ben doesn't, <laughs> That makes me think it's going to work. And part of the issue here, it's not really just money and cash. It's really just cap. $41 million plus is a salary cap. It is not something that they're going to be able to deal with. Expect an extension to smooth the cap out, limit the and lower the number this year and deal with it in the future. Try to get one more year out of their franchise quarterback and get it all under what should be a little bit lower salary cap in 2021. Ian, any sense as to how the, this move and this, this news that Roethlisberger wants to come back and the Steelers want him back will affect their future plans at quarterback? It doesn't sound like it will. If the Steelers are going to end up, let's say, drafting a quarterback, they would probably still be willing to do it because Ben is 39 and you figure this probably will be his last year. I don't get the sense it alters things. They just know they don't need a quarterback right now.
33 touchdowns this season, second most in his career, only to the 34 that he threw back in 2018. Ian, thanks very much. Aaron Rodgers sent the NFL quarterback carousel into warp speed this week when he mentioned his uncertain future following the NFC Championship game loss to the Bucs. He would later clarify on the Pat McAfee show that he has no reason to believe he won't be back in Green Bay next year, which of course should be music to Robert Tunyon's ears as he joins us here on NFL Total Access. Great to have the Packers tied in here with us. Robert, welcome. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us here today. I got to ask you, were, were you at all concerned when, when you heard what Aaron Rodgers said after the game? <clears throat> no, I, I wasn't really worried. Um, for those like us, we know Aaron where he's coming from, and he was just kind of talking about the reality of the league and the business aspect of it. And I think it just kind of caught some people off guard. Uh, they were also in their emotions after our loss, and so were we. So I think, you know, <laughs> tensions were high and emotions were everywhere. So I think, um, you know, at that point, everyone was just trying to, you know, latch on or make a story out of something but you know sure. not definitely not worried about Aaron leaving that certainly seems to be the sentiment now and you guys have built up quite the trust it seems over the course of the last few seasons 11 touchdowns from Aaron this year but what does it take to earn that kind of relationship with a player of Aaron's caliber uh just the will to want to be great and just trying to be the best every day and uh, holding myself to a standard where um, I got to be at my best for my team and whatever role that is. And even if it isn't the biggest role and it's just doing things, uh, you know, in the run game and earning the stuff in the pass game, like if, if that's what we want to do and that's what it's going to take to get to the Super Bowl, that's what I want to do. Um, and he knows that and he sees that. And I think that he just holds me to the same standard that I want to be at and uh, just – Basically, other than being a teammate, he's a good friend to just um, hold me to that standard. Only five days since the uh, NFC Championship game, so I know this is kind of fresh. So uh, apologize if we're pouring salt into an open wound here, but is, is there any advice that you would give the Chiefs for dealing with the Buccaneers defense that you just saw a few days ago? Be ready for that pressure. Be ready for that blitz, <laughs> that's for sure. They're bringing it, especially I, I think they would probably try to play uh, Pat similar to Aaron uh, just by the talent at the quarterback spot. So, you know, I think uh, it's going to be a good game. It's a good matchup and it'll be a, it'll be a good show. You got any any predictions, any idea how this is going to shake out in 10 days? I don't know. I just hope, hoping for a good game. That's it as a fan. I'm with you on that. Well, look, man, I know you partnered with Sleep Number. So tell us a little bit about how their products have helped your performance on the field. Yeah, um, Sleep Number and uh, the 360 bed, just giving me that optimal recovery and sleep uh, for my brain and my body. You know, your brain needs uh, the recovery just as much as your body does. So uh, coming home and, you know, in the morning waking up and seeing my sleep score and, uh, you know, just even if it's competing to get more sleep than than the day before, I'm just trying to, you know, get better and hold myself to a standard and make myself available and the best I can for the team. That is competition right there. The guy competes even when his eyes are closed. Robert Tunyon, <laughs> thanks so much for hanging out with us here today. Appreciate it, man. Thank you for having me. Well, as for the team that got past the Packers, the Bucks in that win over Green Bay, thanks in part to players like Jordan Whitehead, who is our way to play winner of Championship Sunday because of his textbook head out, shoulder and tackle for a forced fumble, huge play in the game. Congrats, Jordan. And for more on the way to play defensive tackle there, check out uh, Gerald McCoy on the latest Total Access, the locker room podcast that drops Friday morning on Apple, Spotify and all your favorite places to find podcasts. Make sure you like and subscribe as McCoy tells Michael Robinson and coach Brian Billick here who he enjoyed sacking the most and well it's no surprise this week on total access the locker room was there a guy that you really enjoyed sacking just from the standpoint that you know okay this is a smart guy so getting to him is going to be tougher so it just it's sweeter when you get home mine was getting to Tom Brady because you everybody's heard the sound bite or the clip where uh, Joey Bosa was like, man, this guy gets the ball out so fast. Yeah. Stop throwing the ball so fast, Tom. So when you get a chance to get to a guy like him, which I was blessed enough to do, 
you're like, man, that wasn't easy, but yeah, I, did it. It. <laughs> I did it. You know, and you take, I mean, you, you cherish those moments. Scan the QR code on the screen right now for the latest episode of Total Access, The Locker Room. Like us and subscribe. New episodes every Wednesday and Friday on Apple and Spotify or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And still to come this week on NFL Total Access Friday, a bold Super Bowl claim and bold Super Bowl predictions. The bold claim that Chiefs defensive coordinator Steve Spagnuolo is the X Factor. We'll explain the bold predictions we will reveal. Then, Saturday, Total Access is your Senior Bowl headquarters. Join us on a scouting trip to the annual showcase of tomorrow's NFL stars. We'll get you started 2 p.m. Eastern time. But first, how do you go from the best sixth round pick in NFL history to the best quarterback in NFL history? The truth about Tom is next. Yeah. That's what we do for right here. Championship Sunday. Of course it's field goal. Of course. Hill Mary. Brady to throw, throws a deep pass downfield. Got Scotty Miller in the open. Makes the catch. Touchdown, Tampa Bay. And we built like that. Right there. We built like that. Let's go do it right now. No penalties, take care of the ball, good routes. If we get first down, that's ball game. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He's got the first down across the 40. Bucks are going to win this football game. <laughs> Let's go. One more. We're at home. I know. We're at home. Let's go, Tommy. Come on, baby. <laughs> we still ain't played our best yet. Nope. We save it. Well, they're trying to get their best now as the Bucks back on the field preparing for Super Bowl 55 just 10 days from now. Earlier, Bruce Arians talking to the media about the Bucks' pursuit of Tom Brady. In his words, you can't hit a home run unless you swing for one. Well, Brady, in the meantime, really wants to win a Super Bowl for his new coach. Uh, experience doesn't matter. Playing well matters. And the team that wins is not going to be the most experienced team. It's going to be the team that plays the best. So we got to prepare the best. We got to execute the best. Um, we've got to perform the best under pressure. And if we do that, we'll be champions. And if we don't, we won't be. Well, let's take a look at the previous nine Super Bowl appearances. All of that experience for Tom, his legend beginning that 0-1 season with the first of his Super Bowls and the win over the Rams. Brady's still the last QB to pilot a team to back-to-back -back championships, winning Super Bowls 38-39. That dark period, relatively speaking, would ensue with losses to the Giants at 42 and 46. Back to his winning ways in 49 with that dramatic win over the Seahawks, and then three straight appearances from Super Bowls 51 to 53 with rings five and six in the process. Now looking for ring number seven, his first as a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. Two guys who have known Tom Brady for a very long time. Mike Giardi covers, covered him now for, what, almost two decades uh, in yes, New sir. England. And then Scott Pioli, having spent so much time there, a big part of those uh, three Super Bowl wins in New England. And Mike... You know, it's like 62 degrees here in L.A., so let's fire up the fireplace a little bit. Let's cozy up here and tell some stories about what you've observed in your time around Tom Brady that makes him the elite competitor that we've come to know. Red, I have two, uh, two that jump out to me. His intense hatred for losing, right? And I'll give you one. You do the bucket drill in training camp where they stick the garbage can about 40 yards down the field and the quarterbacks throw it and you make the round and until someone gets it in and then whoever gets it in, they're the winner. Well, I'm watching it one day and Brian Hoyer drops it in the bucket and they've gone through a few rounds and Hoyer gets it. So Hoyer wins, right? Not so fast. All of a sudden they keep going. I'm like, well, wait, this is not how the no drill normally works. So I talked to Hoyer about it. And you know what he said? He goes, yeah, Tom changed the rules. We had to have another round. Brady gets it. And as soon as Brady gets it, he walks off. That's it. We're all done. And my other one for you is training camp, Jimmy Garoppolo's third year. So this is 2016, I believe it is. And there was a lot of talk about Garoppolo ascending to the, uh, the throne, if you will. And they had a Team Brady versus Team Garoppolo scrimmage. And Tom, I had to go back to my notebook and look this up because I hate stats, but this was really competitive. He went 25 for 25 in that scrimmage and Team Brady <laughs> wiped up the floor with Team Garoppolo. And to me, that was the message, not only to Jimmy, but to Bill and Nick Casario and Josh McDaniels, it's my job. No one's pushing me out. Yeah, you think that might have meant something to him? All right, Scott Pioli, what do you have for us? Well, everyone knows some of those competitive stories, Mike. Those are 
two great anecdotes. I always think about his leadership and what an incredible leader he is and how he does things that are just such great signs of emotional intelligence and empathy for his teammates. I go back to his early career when we were in New England. Brady started receiving some endorsement opportunities after the first Super Bowl and then after the second Super Bowl. And he was offered these opportunities to do commercials, but he refused to do the commercials unless he could have his teammates involved. He did one commercial that he had Troy Brown, David Gibbons, and Dion Branch in. And then he did another co commercial with his entire offensive line. And it was, you know, it was this sign that Tom not only wanted to include them in being a part of his ascension as a player, but what he really wanted to do was make sure that they got paid also, that he wasn't doing this alone. And what Brady did is he didn't take payment for those endorsements or those commercials. He made sure that all of his teammates were the ones getting paid and he sat by the side because he knew he was going to be making his fair share. And it's those moments as a leader when you do things for your teammates that people didn't see, people didn't know about, that are really pretty incredible. I mean, everyone heard the stories about how he took less on his contracts. And I negotiated those second and third contracts with him and his agent, Don Yee, and I watched him and listened to him as he slowed us down and said, listen, if you promise to give more money to other players, I will take less. I want to be a part of a great team. That's a great, uh, that, that is phenomenal insight uh, into what, it, what it's taken for Brady to get to this point and to win all those Super Bowls uh, in New England and, and on the cusp of another one now in Tampa. I have one last anecdote because I was with you for, what, five years in Boston covering Tom Brady. I remember the impact he had on the community, obviously, and one of his favorite causes, the best buddies. Um, and they'd have the flag football game, right, every summer before the, the big ride, the big bicycle ride. And I remember he played all-time quarterback for both teams and there's like i don't know it's like 30 on 30 out there right so he's throwing probably 100 passes out there in the span of like an hour and he completed about 75 percent of them to people like giardi like can you imagine oh. that pioli i mean that, that tells you what kind These of competitor hands, tom brady is good stuff guys appreciate good your nice insight. walk off red more to come on nfl total access uh and total means that we have not forgotten about the teams not Named the Bucks and the Chiefs. After the break, we are playing matchmaker, pairing NFL quarterbacks who may be on the move with NFL teams. We need to make a move. That is next on NFL Total Access. Back live now on NFL Total Access, where Deshaun Watson has requested a trade from the Houston Texans. Will the Jets be among the many teams interested in Watson's services? Well, first, you'd have to know how New York feels about Sam Darnold. The topic Steve Weich and Jim Trotter got into with Jets' new head coach, Robert Sala, on the Huddle & Flow podcast. Ability standpoint, you know, the, he, to be able to create off schedule the way he does, he'd probably be one of the better ones that the system's ever had. Sam's got the ability to create off schedule. Again, his arm talent on the run is uh, up there with the best of them. And so he's he's got a tremendous talent to him and, and he would definitely fit because of his ability to process information and get the ball in and out of his hands in a timely manner. And that at the velocity and the accuracy at which he's able to do it. And we thought last year's QB movement was crazy as we're back here with Andrew Hawkins, Terrell Davis, and Scott Pioli. Uh, this year's QB carousel is going to be wild. So let's dig into it right here. And let's start with the New York Jets. Obviously, let's say that none of these teams are going to be in the market in the draft. They want to take care of their QB situation ahead of the draft in the trade market or in the free agent market. So TD and Hawk, I'm going to give you a team. You tell me who would best fit. And then Scott Pioli, each time I want you to follow with the compensation it would take to acquire such a player. So TD, let's start with the Jets. If they're not going to draft a quarterback, who should they trade for? Uh, the Jets should trade for Deshaun Watson, man. We just talked about Deshaun Watson being one of the best quarterbacks that we've, that we've seen in the game. He can use his legs and go to the Jets until, I, until they figure out how to really settle things down. I think the perfect fit for him would go up there with Robert Sala and that team they're going to run with Mike Flora, uh, you know, uh, Flores. Um, they're going to be able to run that offense, that Mike Shanahan offense up there with him. So I think that's going to be the thing. That's Mike LaFleur, by the way, not Flores. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> TD, you know, this is an important trade because 
this is unprecedented to have a player like this. So to find a comp for a trade like uh, to get a player like Deshaun Watson is really, really difficult. Some people will want to talk about the trades for Jared Goff and Carson Wentz because they were young players and they'll say, okay, it's going to take at least two, two, uh, two ones and maybe a two. But again, you're looking at a very different situation here because when you trade for a rookie player or a rookie draft pick, you have controlled salary. The good news is if you're the Jets, you're paying for a proven commodity. So you go out, you get a player that you know can play in the league, but he doesn't have the salary cap control that you generally get out of a rookie contract. Yeah, we would certainly expect the number two overall pick to be a part of any deal with the Jets. That includes Deshaun Watson and a whole lot more. Hawk, let's get to another team here. Cam Newton set to be a free agent after his one year. Now with the New England Patriots, didn't quite work out. Who should the Patriots look to in the trade market? You know what? I'm putting my Bill Belichick cutoff hoodie on right now, and I'm a little upset because I just got off the phone with my buddy Nick Casario, and he traded Deshaun <laughs> to TD without even calling me. So he's dead to me. No up. Christmas card for him. Right. And now I know people are expecting me to call the Lions and make a trade for Stafford. But I'm sitting here watching all the Super Bowl coverage and Tom Brady going to the big show without me. And I'm thinking, you know what, if I would stuck to my guns and kept Jimmy Garoppolo, I wouldn't be in this situation. <laughs> so I'm going to make a call to the San Francisco 49ers and I'm going to say, hey, give me Jimmy G back. Bring him back. He is a guy who knows my system. He understands what we're building here. I put so much time into his development, and I know I can get the best out of him like nobody else can. And also, it puts our program back on track to where we thought it was going to be. Hawk, if you're going to make that move, it's probably going to take a third of a, or a fourth round pick. I know that may not sound like a lot, but recent history has shown us it's probably going to be about a third or a fourth, maybe a slight chance for a second. If you look at back at the Alex Smith trade, which was for a third and Kendall Fuller, or if you look at the Joe Flacco trade when he went to Denver, it was a fourth. A proven veteran player that has a big contract and you take that, that's where that sliding scale kind of works, where you don't necessarily get as much in compensation in terms of draft picks as you would with a younger player. Again, key point in trades for veteran players is that you not just you don't just trade for a player, you trade for the contract mm. as well. And you could make the argument that Jimmy Garoppolo was at his best in those limited starts he had with New England in that offense with that franchise. Mm -hmm. TD, let's move on to the Indianapolis Colts, probably the best team that we've talked about yet uh, here in this yeah. quarterback carousel. Two of the last three off seasons, they've had a quarterback retire. Now with Phillip Rivers uh, this season hanging it up. So where do you think the Colts should go with the quarterback? Well, we're just talking about the Jets training for Deshaun Watson. So that means off, Sam Darnold is, okay. going to be, is going to be gone or at least uh, sitting there for for the taking. So I think the coach should probably do two things. One, go after Sam Darnold just, you know, because number one, he's a young quarterback. He can come over there, he can grow up in, in that system that Frank Wright has. He's surrounded by a, a lot of young talent, Jonathan Taylor, uh, to be one of those young talents. And they can grow, you can have this guy, you know, for me, I, I love Sam Darnold. I think there's some untapped potential that he still has, and you can have him for four or five years. But if you want to win right now, and you're trying to throw everything into the win, like the Tampa Bay Bucks did, then I'm trading for Matthew Stafford. Mm -hmm. I'm getting Matthew Stafford right now for a one-year, two-year deal. I'm going all in, trying to get our team over that hump, because right now, we've got a ton of talent, and we can probably get there with, with a guy like Matthew Stafford. Ooh, TD, that Matthew Stafford. Deal. I tell you what, if they want to trade for him, they're going to have to do it quickly because Stafford has a fifth day of the league year roster bonus for $10 million. So you're going to have to get to that trade pretty quick. Then we talk about Sam Darnold. You know, I think that maybe it ends up being much of the same that we just talked about. It's a third or fourth round pick. If you look back historically again, you see a player like Josh Rosen who wasn't proven that went for a second round pick. They know that they paid too much for him. But what's more on the scales, maybe Tyrod Taylor, who went for a third round pick. So I think that's kind of where that would be. But the Stafford one is interesting. They're going to unload him early is my guess. Okay, so with the Lions set to move on from Matthew Stafford, uh, Andrew Hawkins, and they could be one of those teams that's in play for the top four quarterbacks uh, in the draft with a top ten draft pick like they have. But let's, let's leave that out of the equation for right now. In the veteran market for quarterbacks, where should they go, Hawk? You know what? I'm going to say we don't need to do a trade. 
Let's go get Jameis Winston. He's a free agent. He's available. This is a guy who's thrown for over 4,000 yards three times. 5,000 in his last year as a starter. Sure, he threw 30 interceptions sure. that year. But look at the bright side of last year. He didn't throw any, Rhett. This is a guy <laughs> that, again, he is a first overall pick. You know, he has the talent. Let's just hone him in. We're, we're building things different in Detroit. If you want to bite kneecaps, come on to Detroit. Let's eat some W's and bite kneecaps all together in harmony, Scott Pioli. <laughs> wow, Hawk, I'm not sure if I'm going to be a season ticket holder for you because I'm not sure I want to go watch Jameis play. But I guess the contract that's best for Jameis right now would probably be very similar to what he did this year. He played for the minimum salary this year in New Orleans. Allegedly, he was offered more than that, chose to go to New Orleans. But to me, the deal that you do if you're going to sign a player like Jameis Winston is you do a very low base, possibly the minimum, and build it with incentives, much like the Cam Newton contract this year and much like the Ryan Tannehill contract a couple of years ago with the Titans. But pay for play. And look, Hawk, to your point, in a playoff game with Drew Brees and Tom Brady at quarterback, it was Jameis Winston that threw the first touchdown pass of the game. <laughs> Sign him up right now to the Detroit Lions. Thanks very much, guys. Way to work. Hey, when you're about to face guys like Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Rob Gronkowski, and possibly Antonio Brown, a bad day is not an option. Closer look at the Super Bowl's most important and possibly most stressed out position group. The Chiefs secondary. Next. All right, back here on NFL Total Access, where the Chiefs out on the practice field again today. And Andy Reid saying everyone on the team participated in some form or fashion today, except for Eric Fisher, who, of course, tore his Achilles, won't play in Super Bowl 55. The defense will have a tall task here in 10 days, trying to figure out how to shut down the GOAT. Brian Baldinger now with a look inside the X's and O's of that challenge. In this Baldy Super Bowl breakdown, I want to take a look at the star of the Chiefs defense in their AFC Championship game. The secondary, they did it all. They blitzed, they covered, they took Stephon Diggs out of the game, and they created turnovers. And here's how they did it. I mean, on this blitz right here, it's what we call a zero blitz. They're all coming after Josh Allen. But watch Juan Thornhill here. He's got to cover Cole Beasley one-on-one -on -one right now, no help. And he gets in perfect position, anticipates the throw, almost comes up the pit. Now, they were blitzers, too. Here comes Legereus Sneed and Daniel Sorensen off the edge. Quick speed to force Josh Allen into a mistake here. Eating a sack, 15-yard loss, critical mistake. Tyra Matthew, speed to the quarterback. That's what the defensive coordinator, Steve Spagnuolo, likes. And you force Josh Allen into an intentional grounding. Quick speed, quick, quick, quick. Blitz right here, Daniel Sorensen. Right beats the back right here and gets to Josh Allen before he can get that screen pass off. Now, the other part was they took Stephon Diggs out of the game. I mean, right here on this dig route, watch the timing in the break by Juan Thornhill, separating Diggs from the ball. And then watch Legereus Sneed, number 38, cover Stephon Diggs. He beats him, anticipates the route, and then he gets safety help over the top. That's what you call a sandwich bracket technique. And sometimes they held up one-on-one. -on -one. But Shad Breeland on Stephon Diggs, not many people would do that in this league. And then the biggest play of the game right here. Rashad Breeland on that throw to Smoke Brown gets tipped. And Rashad Fenton, who is in there for Legereus Need, comes up with an important interception, takeaway stalling the Bills drive. This Chiefs secondary is special. They can do it all, and they might have to in Super Bowl 55. All right, Baldy, looking at the stars of tomorrow. It is Reese's Senior Bowl week in Mobile. Both teams on the practice field today. Last full real practice of the week. And we'll have a full recap of those workouts after total access. The game kicks off at 2.30 Eastern on Saturday afternoon right here on NFL Network. Here's Andrew Siciliano now and Bucky Brooks with a look at the standouts. So, Bucky Brooks, Matt Rule made it clear on Wednesday, and he made it clear again before practice on Thursday that the final practice of the week was the most important practice of the week. With that said, who'd you like out there Thursday? You know, Andrew, Thursday is really the most important day because you're putting the finishing touches on the week. And I will say, offensively, Amari Rodgers was the star of the day. His ability to get open versus everybody as a slot receiver has been very, very impressive. His timing, his route running ability, his consistent separation, and finally his hands has certainly made him be one of the guys that we will talk about after this is said and done. On defense, it's all about Richie Grant and his ability to get his hands on the ball. 
two interceptions a day, does a great job of anticipating where quarterbacks are going with their throws. And most importantly, he comes down with the interception when he gets a chance. There were a lot of questions about the safety class coming down to Mobile. Richie Grant has emerged as a star. He has certainly helped himself with his performance. In a lot of these drills, the wide receivers do have the advantage here. Richie Grant is one of the DBs that really showed up, was able to take the ball away, had those two key picks, both of them on Jamie Newman, the Wake Forest quarterback. He almost had a third interception. And we're looking forward to seeing all of them Coming up in the actual game, the Reese's Senior Bowl Saturday. It's going to be 2.30 Eastern time live from Mobile, Alabama, right here on NFL Network. <laughs> Much guys back here with Scott Pioli. I know you're going to have your eye on the Senior Bowl, a uh, former scout that you are. Uh, but recently, you and our colleague Mark Ross uh, recently took part in a virtual speaker series with HBU, HBCU careers in football and then also women's careers in football, trying to give some insight about what it takes to be an executive with a team in the league. Give us a sense of, of what went into that discussion and what it was like. Yeah, it was tremendous, Rhett. You know, we spent some time, again, in a virtual call with a large number of people, like you say, from HBCUs and women that are involved with the women career pathways in football. And we spent some time talking about networking, about mentoring, about our history. And what we did is we made connections with these folks. And what it did was we told them stories, we taught them, but most importantly, we talked about moving forward with the opportunities that they're going to be having sometime very soon. Well, that's awesome. That's great work, and uh, we love to see it here in the NFL. Thanks very much, Scott. Appreciate that. And coming up next here on NFL Total Access, we're looking for a story within a story. What's the one Super Bowl storyline that people aren't talking about, but should be. Give it a minute, and we'll compare answers right after the break here on NFL Total Access. NFL Total Access. All right, back here on NFL Total Access. Ten days until Super Bowl 55. Hawk TD, let's get a storyline that will define this game. What do you got, Hawk? Yeah, I'm going for Eric Bieniemy. I mean, this is uh, one of the best offenses we've ever seen in the league. Two years, he could potentially be another Super Bowl champion and doesn't have a head coaching job. That's the storyline that I'm continuing to follow throughout the Super Bowl week. And for me, for me, it's Antonio Brown, man. This guy was almost out of football a couple of years ago, and now he has a chance, if he's healthy to play in a football game, to impact the Super Bowl and win one. So to me, that's an amazing story. He was out of football, and I didn't think I'd see this this day with Antonio Brown being in the Super Bowl. Guys, can we end on some great news here that we found out, uh, courtesy of Ron yes. Rivera's daughter, Courtney, who posted on Twitter that her dad is officially oh. cancer-free. Congrats to Ron and the whole